Mr. Secretary, I'd like to get your assessment of the Trump presidency so far. Well, so far, it's up and down. There have been some strong things. There have been some not so strong things. What would you so say? Has, what would you say has been the, the strong parts of the Trump presidency? Well, I think that uh, we've got some very good people in the cabinet. The one that I know best is Jim Mattis. He's been here at Hoover the last couple of years or so, and he is a really great man. He's very able. He's widely read, he's thoughtful, he's had a lot of experience, he's tough-minded, and Mr. Trump must know that when he asks Jim Mattis a question, he's gonna hear exactly what Jim Mattis thinks without any embellishments, he's head on. So he's a terrific guy. What would you say are the down parts of the, of the administration so far? Well, obviously, when you roll out a big initiative and it blows up, that's a downer. I think it's important for a president to get off to a start where people see he says what he means, he means what he says, and he can carry out what he starts out to carry out. Let me give you an example from the Reagan years. Early on, you may remember, the air traffic controllers struck. And President Reagan said they, they took an oath of office that they wouldn't strike, they violated their oath, they're out. So it was very decisive on principle. And people all over the world said, is the man crazy? Who's going to, what about the planes? But he has a secretary of transportation, a guy who'd run a big transportation company, his name was Drew Lewis. And he was a chief executive. So he understood the problem and he understood how to get something done. So working with the president, they had military people and managerial people in the towers. They had an aggressive recruiting and training program and they kept the planes flying. So the world people said, hey, watch out, the guy plays for keeps. So that established him. So I, I think it's very important that he gets some initiatives that are important and he's decisive and they work. The travel ban that you mentioned that didn't go well for the president at first, as a former secretary of state, what implications did that have in terms of America and its global relationships? Well, whether it was directed at Muslims or not, the courts thought so because of the campaign rhetoric and probably people around the world thought so. And that's a mistake because we need to have an open arm to, Muslim, to this Islam. There's a battle going on within Islam and it's a very rough battle. And we need to position ourselves. We're not against Islam. We're against the people who are radicalizing and take them on. It's important to make it have that message. You said that you, your advice to President Trump was that he not let the White House dominate anything. What does that mean? Well, I think over a long period of time, there has become a tendency to put decision making and even operational things in the White House. The White House staff has grown a lot, the NSC staff has grown a lot, with the result that that's a dominant place. I remember in Bob Gates' memoir, he says he was in Afghanistan and he sees a white telephone, he picks it up, it's connected to some kid in the White House. And Bob says he yanked it out and threw it at somebody. But you can't run things that way. So I would hope once he gets things settled down, the president might say something like this. I consider my cabinet and sub-cabinet people to be my staff. Those are the people I'm gonna work with to develop policy, and they are the ones who are gonna execute it under my supervision, but they're gonna execute it. When you do that, you get good people, you get all people who've been confirmed by the Senate, people who can be called to testify at any time so they're responsible, accountable people, and you get better policy and you get better execution. And it's much less expensive. You don't need these big White House staffs. You worked for Ronald Reagan, of course. He came to Washington to revolutionize the way Washington, the role it played in people's lives. Do you see any parallel between Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan? Well, they seem to have similar objectives. But don't forget, President Reagan's background was different. He was, for eight years, governor of California. We have a big state out here. 
It's complicated. It's got everything in the world. Vibrant creativity. More agriculture than any other state. All kinds of industry. Military is here. We have a big naval base in San Diego. Big uh, marine base. And so on. So he's governing over a very complicated state. So Washington is different, but not that different. Ronald Reagan was known for his optimism. He said, uh, whatever may happen, he said, I hope you will remember that I appeal to your hopes and not your fears. Donald Trump seems to have a different message. Well, he has uh, ambitions, just like Ronald Reagan did. But there, there's no point in trying to c compare them to them. They're very different people and different backgrounds, not the same at all. You were in business, successful businessman. Then you came to Washington. You went back and forth between those two worlds. What it, uh, I also had quite a lot of time in academic world. So you, you came which from Which I never really left. Right. Uh, as somebody who worked in the business world, though, and the, and the Washington world, what are the upsides of having been in business and coming to Washington? And then what are the ways in which, when you're in the business world, Washington doesn't work the same way, since we've got a, a businessman as president now? Well, I, Mr. Tillerson called me up. I don't know him. And I said, I hear you're being knocked for being a businessman. He said, I was a businessman. And let me tell you, you have two big advantages. Number one, you've known how to run a big organization. So you realize it's not about me, it's about the organization. Getting the organization rolling so that it does things. Say, so as head of Exxon, you didn't want to run a refinery, but you wanted to be damn sure you had people in the company that did know how to do it. By the same token of the State Department, you've got people stationed all over the world. And the Foreign Service people are very good people. So a big part of your job is to see to it that that organization works. And it's not that difficult, but you can do it. You know how to do that. And the second thing that's happened to you as a businessman is you go places and you have to hire people and fire people and buy things and sell things and get your money out and all kinds of things like that. That's kind of the way the country really works. But you don't see that from a chancery. That's not on their wavelength. So you have the advantage when you go to a country of really understanding how it works. And that's a big advantage. What advice did you give Secretary of State Tillerson? Well, I think the Secretary of State has to establish two things. One, that he's close to the president and that he speaks for the president. And being close, the president listens to him. So together, they formulate a policy. People always ask me if what was my foreign policy. And I always said, I don't have one. The president has one. And my job is to help him formulate it and carry it out. So you've got to be close to the president and let that be visible. I had twice a week private meetings with President Reagan. And they were on his public calendar, so everybody knew they were happening. So we had very good from my standpoint, and I think his standpoint, as we shared views about all kinds of things, particularly I could say, Mr. President, here's a, here's a problem on the horizon. There's nothing critical about it, but you can see it, clouds are beginning to form. And here's the way I'm thinking about it. What do you think? And we talk about it. And by the time something becomes more critical, we've talked about it. And we have ideas about it. And I know how he thinks. So that's very important for him to do that. And the second thing, of course, is to let it be clear that he has uh, really got his department working with him in a way that he wants. And he can do that. What do you think of the Secretary of State's decision not to bring a press corps with him on, on his trip to Asia recently? Uh, I don't uh, understand exactly. He must have some good reason for that. I had my first cabinet job was Secretary of Labor. And there's a job called press person. And I scratched my head about who to have. And then I, I decided I'd try to get a guy named Joe Loftus. He was a really good labor reporter to New York Times. And all of us who were in that field read his stuff. He was a pro. So he'd been doing it for a long time. So I called him. I said, Joe, what about it? 
So he came over, and to my delight, he was interested. He said, well, I'll, cons I'll, I'll do it, but I have conditions. I said, what are your conditions? Well, he says, first of all, I have to be able to walk into any meeting any time. I said, okay, you will make a contribution, but why? He says, because I can't be blindsided. Once you're blindsided, you've lost. What else? Don't lie. Oh, come on, Joe, I don't lie. He said, you'd be surprised what happens. People get under pressure. and If they don't lie, they mislead. And you can't do that because the minute you do that, you, people lose confidence. So there's nothing wrong with saying no comment if you don't want to comment on something. But don't lie. Don't Maybe. mislead. And then he said, um, he said, uh, if I see a reporter working on a story, I'll help him get the facts. I said, why are you doing that, Joe? He said, but you don't realize the reporters who cover your department present you to the world. That's the way people know what you're doing and what you're thinking. So maybe they're on your side, maybe they're not, but at least try to help them get the facts straight. And, but it was a big lesson for me. The press is, um, they may have their opinions, but Basically, they are the way that your point of view gets across to the American people. So try to make it as factually correct as possible. So Joe was wonderful, and of course, all the press respected him. And he, was, he taught me a lot of good lessons. How important as Secretary of State is it to make sure that you get your message across precisely because diplomatic language is so uh, fraught, it's so potentially one comma and you can and you can cause an international incident. How important is it to have a press corps with you as Secretary of State to make sure you get the message across correctly? Well, of course, first of all, you have your spokesman. And the spokesman is on the podium practically every day in the State Department. And you want a good person there. I had several that were very good. The last one, who was a Foreign Service officer, and he was excellent because he knew the building and he knew who knew what. And, you know, people are reluctant often, but he knew where to push the buttons and get the information. So he was really very good. So that's an important function. Let me ask you about honesty in, in public office. President Trump made a claim that his predecessor, President Obama, wiretapped his, his uh, Trump Tower, and now the director of the FBI has said he has no evidence of, of that. What cost is that for a president to say something that doesn't turn out to have evidence behind it? Well, he's got to figure out a way not to get out of it, to say, okay, I made a mistake, and go on from there. Because you've got to establish a, a atmosphere of trust Trust is the coin of the realm. And you need to do that with other leaders or people you're going to deal with, including your adversaries. For instance, Shevardnadze was my foreign minister of the Soviet Union. We became friends, although we were adversarial. But we trusted each other. So at one point, he said to me, he asked for a private meeting, he said, we have decided, past tense, to leave Afghanistan. We haven't decided on the date, and we haven't decided on the, when we'll announce it, but we're going to leave. This was a giant thing. And he said, I'm telling you this because maybe we could think along together a little bit and how we could ha have it happen with a minimum loss of life. So I told the president, but that's all. He could never tell me that if he didn't trust me. And having told me that, it was a very important piece of information for me. So you've got to develop the trust as the coin of the realm. I go back to my days in Marine Corps boot camp at the start of World War II. Sergeant hands me my rifle. He says, take good care of this rifle. This is your best friend. And remember one thing. Never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull the trigger. No empty threats. And you can extrapolate that and say, mean what you say and carry out what you say you're going to carry out. Then people will trust you. Then they can deal with you. Because they know if you say, you'll, I'll do something, you'll do something, you'll do what you said you're going to do. 
if I can't trust you, I can't deal. But if you trust you, then I can deal. And so trust is the coin of the realm. Very important point. Looking at Donald Trump's foreign policy, do you have a, a sense of it? Well, it's evolving. And um, it shifts around quite a bit as far as I can see. But I'm uh, glad to see he's supporting NATO. He's gotten off the challenge to the one China policy. Uh, Secretary of State Tillerson was in Beijing, I read. I, but um, Xi is coming to the United States. That's a good thing. If he can develop a good relationship with the president of China, that's very important. Which? And I think it's, I know him slightly, and I think it's quite possible. He's a real human being. And you can have a discussion with him, and I'll give you an example. We have had a track two with uh, China that Henry Kissinger has been the leader of. So we go over to Beijing, and Xi was, was known that he was going to be president, but he wasn't president yet. Gave a dinner for us in the state guest house. He gave a talk, Henry gave a talk, and then we had a dinner, and I sat beside him at dinner. And I knew he was going to Washington. So I said, on your way to Washington, why don't you stop in San Francisco? We've got a Chinese-American mayor who's doing a good job and be a nice turnout, be a nice thing to do. And he said, well, I've already agreed to stop in Los Angeles, so I can't do that. But if I came that way, what I'd really like to do is come to Stanford because there's something going on around there that I need to know about. And you can only know about it if you're there and you get a direct feeling. Well, I was fascinated, number one, that he knew about the Silicon Valley business. And number two, that he felt, you don't understand something by just reading about it. You've got to go there and talk to people and feel it. Very wise. Back to the State Department for a moment. Uh, Donald Trump's budget, which will get changed by Congress, but it is a way that a president talks about priorities. In Donald Trump's budget, he cuts significantly expenditures for the State Department. What are the possible risks of that? Well, the State Department has a big role to play. And it has a, a big, it's a big enterprise. It has people stationed in embassies around the world. The embassies are very important. There are eyes and ears around the world. And they're also the way that we express ourselves and people look at the embassy and it's a way of judging it. So the embassies are very important. And what the implications are for that, I don't know. I don't know this, what the, the problems in the State Department budget are right now, but there are also all sorts of special things that you need to focus on. That is, I know that you have to have an active program of fighting terrorism. You need an, there's an economic bureau in the State Department that a lot of international stuff has many implications. Um, then there's a, um, a military person that's stationed in the State Department and this guy, I had two really first-class first class people. If anything happens, they're over in the tank, and I know what the chiefs are thinking. If it, if it didn't have that, it would take three days for the bureaucratic process to give me that. But we had a way of an intimate exchange. So there are all kinds of special things in the department that you want to maintain. They're good. And where, what the implications of this cut are, I don't know. Some people heard President Trump's inaugural address and some of the things he's said, and they feel like his version of nationalism is pulling America back a little from its foreign commitments. He argues, the president does, that America has been extended too far overseas and has lost focus on what's happening at home. Do you share that view? And do you, what is America's role in the world for those people who are who are concerned about whether America has extended itself too far and whether there's really a benefit to doing that. Well, there's, you can extend yourself too far, and we've made some mistakes. But um, I think that we have a major role in the world. If we're not there, there's no leadership. Think about it. At the end of World War II, some gifted people with names like Atchison, Marshall, and Truman looked back. What did they see? They saw two world wars. The second one started in part because the first one was 
settled in rather bad terms. They saw 51 million people were killed in the Second World War, let alone injured. They saw the Holocaust. They saw the Great Depression and the protectionism and the currency manipulation that aggravated it. And they said to themselves, what a crummy world. And we're part of it, whether we like it or not. So they set out to try to change it. We had the Bretton Woods meeting. People think somehow this was a US dictation. There were 44 countries at Bretton Woods. And so it was US gave leadership to developing something that dealt with trade, that dealt with currencies, that dealt with uh, development needs and so on. So this was very constructive. Then comes the Cold War. The doctrine of containment comes forward. NATO comes forward. This is all US leadership, but not domination. And by the time the Cold War was over, I think you could say there was in the world a security and economic commons from which everybody benefited. Unfortunately, that has fallen apart, in part because we have withdrawn. And there's no, Russia can't take our place, China can't take our place. Only the United States can do it, and it doesn't mean you go around telling people what to do. I think some, to some extent our Afghanistan and Iraqi experience should teach us something about that. But you go around the world trying to make life better, and better for people, but better for the United States, because a healthy world is to our advantage. I'd like to get your assessment of the U.S. relationship with Russia right now. Well, Russia is a bad actor. It seems to take no notice of agreements of borders. When Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, there was a deal. And my colleague here at Stanford, Bill Perry, was at Secretary of Defense. He had a large part in the And the deal was, we'll give up our weapons and you respect our borders. Russia seems to pay no attention to the fact that they made that agreement. And they are being very disruptive in the Middle East. The way they have, the cruelty they've imposed on Aleppo is stunning. So in my opinion, they have a lot to answer for. What? They're playing a very weak hand. They're playing it aggressively. And I think if we put up a big stop sign, they will change because their demography is against them, their economy is against them. They, they uh, have a very weak hand. What would your advice be about U.S. policy towards Russia to put up that stop sign, as you call it? Well, we put it up in the Ukraine. I think we should be ready to arm the Ukrainian armed forces with serious armaments. We don't need to put any of our boots on the ground. These are Ukrainian boots on the ground. We have to shore up the Baltic states. I think there could be an energy initiative that assures them they're not dependent on Russia for oil and gas. We can cure that problem. And they are putting some troops there, I see. That's a good thing. So we're shoring up. In the Middle East, we have a terrible strife going on between Iran, which now has all this extra money from the deal, and they're using it to uh, extend the Shiite um, control in the Middle East. So that's a big issue. We need to know who we're on the side of there, namely Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, Israel, of course. You've talked a lot about the power and strength and importance of American alliances. What do America's allies need to hear right now? Well, they need to hear that we're, we're we're in the alliance, full bore. And they've been hearing that, I think. And I noticed in the really good speech that President Trump gave to the Congress not long ago, he was four square in saying NATO was key. When Donald Trump has said some things, whether it's with the travel ban or with his remarks about NATO or other things, do you think that that he is uh, learning the cost of those comments in terms of the diplomatic cost and that this is just a part of a learning curve that all presidents go through? I, I, well, I think he has shifted in the things he says quite markedly between during the campaign and now. During your time as Secretary of State, the 
um, the United States and Russia work to, to shrink their nuclear stockpiles. President Trump has said the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability. What do you think about that, expanding the nuclear capability? Well, I think one of the big threats to humanity is nuclear weapons. People have forgotten how powerful they are. If a modern nuclear weapon were dropped on New York City, it would incinerate the city, the same as any place. It would incinerate the Bay Area. There, And I remember after the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident, which was vast destruction, the first meeting I had with Gorbachev after that, I found that he'd asked the same question I had. I asked people, what's the relationship between the damage we see there and what would have happened if a nuclear weapon had been dropped there? Answer, far more destructive, the nuclear weapon. So it gave you a feeling in your stomach about these weapons. Um, and you, you realize it's, they shouldn't be around. Bill Swing, he's the retired Episcopal Bishop of California, a great guy. He wrote something during the campaign. I tried to get it published, but I couldn't get it published. But he basically said, you put your hand on the Bible and swear to be president of the United States. That's the least of it. It's when you put your hand on the nuclear lever you're no longer president, you're God. Only God could press a button and kill a million people. So it's a different thing. But in the history on our Soviet, we had deployed intermediate range ballistic nuclear tipped weapons in Germany. And that was a, a sign of terrific strength because the allies were with us. And it was the turning point in the Cold War. And after that, as they saw that strength, then the alternative of having a better relationship began to emerge. So we, began, we took advantage of that. A couple more questions. Donald Trump has pulled the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What did you think of that? Well, I think that I wouldn't have done that myself. I think it was an important initiative with our friends in Asia. And that's a big part of the trading system of the world. And these trade packs are not just trade packs. They are an agreement that brings you together and you talk about all kinds of things that make life go better and life go easier. Same is true of NAFTA. I've been very much involved in that. And it's not just a trade thing, although the trade has been very important, but it gives us a vehicle we're talking about common problems of terrorism, of the border crossing. The border crossings in Mexico right now are not Mexicans. They're Central Americans. So how does Mexico avoid becoming a transit country? And they are working with, they've been working with us on that and trying to solve that problem. And that's the kind of thing you get out of a good working relationship with other countries. What's your opinion about the president's commitment to build a wall along the southern border of the United States? Well, he's going to try to build it, I guess. And uh, we seem to have decided to declare war, economic war on Mexico, and call their citizens rapists and criminals. It's not good. This, these are our neighbors. You go into a construction job in California, if you don't speak Spanish, you don't know what's going on. And they do a good job. And they're all through. And there's been a lot of antagonism. You know, they think they still own Texas and California, um, but they were getting over that. But now, talk about sending military, are you kidding? I always say, if you buy a house, you look at the house, but what else do you look at? You look at the neighborhood, and that makes all the difference. If it's safe, where are the schools? Where, are the, where do you buy a loaf of bread? Same in foreign policy. When President Reagan and I started, we said foreign policy starts in your neighborhood. If you have a good neighborhood, you're gonna be all right. So my first trip out of the country was to Canada. And all the traveling place press said, what are you doing going to Canada? I said, who do you think our biggest trading partner is? They all said China or Japan or something. I said, not even close. 
Canada. And there are more telephone calls between Canadians and Americans than any other two countries a day. And there are a million Canadians in California today. And they have a very good K through 12 education system in Canada. So we're lucky to have them. They're part of our creativity. So the neighborhood matters. And we started in Mexico, considered itself part of Latin America. And by the time we wound up, and they had a wonderful president named Dilla Madrid, they thought, OK, we're in North America. And they did a lot of things, Dilla Madrid did, to have that happen. And then it was followed up. We had a US-Canada free trade agreement. And so in a sense, NAFTA was added Mexico to that. And it's worked. Last question. You wrote a book that uh, I believe it was called Things on My Mind. Learning from experience. Yeah. What else, what else is on your mind these days? Well, I have five great grandchildren, and I watch them. They don't walk anywhere, they run. They're curious about everything. And there's so much fun, there's so much life in them. And I look at them and I say to myself, what kind of a world are they going to inherit? And is there anything I can do that will make it a little better. So that's my main motivating spirit. That's great. Mr. Secretary, thanks for being with us.